evening, you rollins. And to those who like it, uh, landscape, sadly, there's two of us tonight, so um, it can't be landscape. But uh, to get the housekeeping out of the way, the next live is going to be Wednesday, 2nd of August, number 23. Um, and, and to start this, to introduce Philip, I'm going to give you some background, just in case there's anybody here that's not quite au fait with where we are. Where we are is Alex Belfield is a self-admitted liar, and I'm going to quote him at the beginning of this so you get that he's a self-confessed liar. Uh, Mr. Belfield, in his statement to the court of the Royal Courts of Justice, uh, he said to the court via his uh, representative, the defamatory and seriously harmful allegations of dishonesty which he made against Jeremy Vine are entirely false. He wishes to apologise unreservedly publicly for the damage and distress caused to Jeremy Vine and his reputation by his publications and express his profound and unreserved regret for all of the harm for which he is responsible. So that was Alex Belfield's statement to uh, the defamation court at the Royal Court of Justice. Now, remember that the trial was a four-week trial starting in July and ending in August, and the sentencing happened on September the 16th, 2022. Now, I'm going to give you what I call count five, count six, count eight, and then count seven. And count seven was, was Philip's count. And the reason I'm doing this is so that you get what actually happened at court. So count five, BBC Radio Northampton's Bernie Keith, Alex Belfield was guilty of stalking to cause alarm and distress. Belfield has been given two and a half years in prison on count five. Count six, videographer Ben Hewis, guilty of stalking to cause alarm and distress. The sentence is consecutive to the previous term for Mr. Keith. The term again is two and a half years. Count eight, Jeremy Vine, not guilty of stalking to cause alarm and distress, but guilty of simple stalking. Belfield is sentenced to 13 weeks consecutively for stalking Mr. Vine. And let's get to Philip. Philip Dehaney, count seven. Philip Dehaney, not guilty to stalking to cause alarm and distress, but guilty to simple stalking. Uh, Mr. Belfield received a consecutive sentence of 13 weeks. Philip Dehaney is a theatre blogger at That Stagey Blog. Philip also has a YouTube channel, I Am That. Philip is an actor and campaigner for the Terence Higgins Trust. Welcome to the Theatre of the Mind, Philip Dehaney. Thank you. We got that. We got that. Finally, in the end. Um, I hope you're not getting my feedback. I'll work uh, away from it. But, no, no, um, I can hear you loud and clear. Fabulous. So I think we need to start at, at a natural place, Philip. Um, most people will have their feet under the table. Um, and what we will do is uh, Philip and I will chat and give you some insight into what happened, why it happened, where it happened, how it happened. And then we may take some questions at the end of that. So if you have any questions, and I, and I want you to be adult about the questions, otherwise um, I might... My two rets might kick in, and I might go all sweary Mary on you, but I want you to be adult about things. Um, Philip, let's start at the beginning, because I'm, I'm really unsure as to how you got involved with this whole Belfield saga. Yeah, I mean, Adrian, I just want to say thanks, first of all, for inviting me on your channel. Um, part of the reason I'm talking to you is because you actually reached out to me. Um, I think there were a lot of people out there that are posting videos about Alex Belfield, without a real insight or understanding of who he is. And you know, have known him for 20, 25 years? Yeah, since he was 17, he's 43 now. So you know the case and you've obviously followed it throughout this. Um, and this is the thing, it's not a soap opera. This is my life that we're discussing, that people are commenting on and making videos and people Obviously, Alex Belfield is a hot topic, and it feels like sometimes people are just making videos and putting his name in a video to put their channel or to get clicks. 
Whereas with you, I, I trust that you want to get the truth out there yeah. in the same way that I do. Like my channel is not monetized. Um, we'll come onto this later about why I'm finally speaking out. But um, yeah, this is part of the reason I'm talking to you today is out of gratitude because you did check in on me. You reached out to me. You made sure I was okay, um, which a lot of these people who are making these videos haven't done. So I just wanted to say that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I only know of you through what happened at the beginning of the trial. I wasn't there at, at the court, but before we get to what actually happened at uh, Nottingham Crown Court, how on earth did you get entangled with Alex Belfield, so to speak? I wish I knew. I honestly do. This is a weird thing because obviously he was sentenced and is now in prison for stalking me. But he redefined the definition of stalking. And it is within the, the terms of the, the, the new kind of legislation that stalking can be through mediums like social media. So in my case, it started with, like, we have never to this day met. Like, although we were both in the same courtroom, um, we'll come to this again, he presented, I presented my evidence behind a, a curtain. So I didn't see him. Um, and to this day, like, we've never been face to face. And that was part of the problem where he was, if he had said half the stuff that he was saying to me face to face, that would have been an offence. But because he was saying it behind a camera and I was then watching it, on a video that wasn't illegal so that's why platforms like youtube he when he said throughout this that he's within the law he was right to an extent that he was make videos and it is free speech but where it became stalking was when what else he did and we'll come on to that later okay um was it through ben hewis that you that Belfield came onto your radar? No, so th this is what happened. So basically, I was a theatre blogger with that stagey blog, and I had never heard of Belfield. Belfield had started posting his own reviews on his channel, declaring himself as the number one reviewer on Google and in Las Vegas. Um, he would then tag me. So he would make a video and then post it on Twitter, would tag me in it, as a way to kind of, I guess, look for endorsement or support or asking me to retweet it. But again, within that, he didn't ask me outright. He just kind of tagged me in things. So out of curiosity, I would click on a few videos and see what he was up to. And if I'm honest, I was just shocked by what he was producing. He was taking himself to previews. And so he was never invited to watch these shows or review them. He'd take himself to them when they weren't ready, before they'd even opened, while they were still in preview, to create a video so that he could be the first to talk about them. And then he would, like I say, tag me in his reviews as if a way to kind of encourage me to endorse him or support him or retweet him. Um, and it got to an extent where like, I had to be firm and said, like, please stop tagging me. And then at that point, he didn't. That was the first instance where, like I said, I never met him, didn't know him. I'd clicked on a few of his videos, didn't like what I saw, asked him firmly to stop tagging me, and then he continued to tag me. And then we led on to the Ben Hewis situation. What? Why would he be tagging you? Do you know? Like I say, the only thing that I can deduce is that he was trying to align himself as a theatre blogger um, in the same way well, you do when you you see people who are doing a similar thing. You kind of reach out to them. You'd be like, "Can you can you share this? Can you help me here?" So I I took it as that was what he was trying to do, because like I say, he I never met him. I I don't know why he was interested in me, or I don't think at that point he even knew that I used to work at the BBC, which would factor in later. But yeah, it was completely out of the blue. Liz, Liz Green's been in touch. Let me just pass this on to you. Um, no one knows what this was like. 
Hi, Liz, by the way. No one knows what this was like. Phil is incredibly brave to do this and has always handled it, both before, during and after the court case with dignity and courage. Thank you. So Liz is an incredible woman. She was one of the eight witnesses who gave evidence in the trial. Um, one of the four women who got a non-guilty verdict, which I, I still don't understand. I think it comes down to the lack of evidence. Um, but I still maintain, I think those four women suffered far more than the rest of us because they endured it for a decade. Yeah. Like me and Jeremy, we had two years of it. Um, but they had over a decade of this um, and they didn't get their vindication or. So, yeah, I, think, I, I want to get to, uh, as Jeremy described, the tsunami of hate. I want to get to that. Was it when Ben Hughes was in touch with you or was it when Belfield just targeted you and um, and your family? It kind of stopped and started because obviously initially um, what happened was he, he targeted Ben Hewis. Uh, ben was a friend of mine. Things and like Jer Alec invited my commentary on it. So basically he made this horrendous video about Ben Hewis where he was using photographs of Ben's children um, and declaring that he was going to, sue him he was going to like lose his house he was going to lose his wife and kids and i remember reacting to this thinking this is disgusting this is awful so i at that point and this was the thing with having asked belleville to stop tagging me he then tagged me in this video saying do you think this is fair question mark so inviting my response so at that point I just had to take, I never watched the video fully. I watched the first few minutes, got an impression of what I thought it was, and then responded. Did I think it was fair? I reacted to that. So I, it was an open question. I then posted an article on my website talking about my experience with Belfield to that point, talking about my experience with Ben and how Ben, I knew to be this incredible man a family man, a man who wouldn't hurt a fly, worked for the What's On Stage Awards, worked with charities, had a great initiative to try and bring young people into theatre. And here he was, under fire, being attacked by Alex Belfield and being threatened and using these images of his own children in this video with these threatening overtones of he was going to lose his house because he was going to take legal action against him. And none of it made sense. It, like, it was just bewildering. But like I say, I stuck up for Ben and I posted this article. And that is when it didn't even start initially. Like he waited about six weeks while the article was still there. So like I say, if he was that concerned that article was damaging, he'd have been straight on it. Instead, he waited until later in the year and then reached out to me with an email um and it was all bizarre it was kind of like it suggested that he was being he was in a court case with the bbc and they were supporting him um it was all kind of legal jargon but didn't really make sense and it was kind of suggesting that my my article about him was libel but obviously i hadn't posted anything about him I just kind of it was more about Ben so yeah at that point I didn't I, I it made no sense to me to be honest and then it kind of like I say escalated later in the year and these were the patterns you you notice throughout this he kind of I would get an email about two in the morning on New Year's Day where I was at home with my family and I was posting pictures on social media which he will have been able to see because he talked about it. He said that he'd seen these videos. Um, and there he was, and then sending me these emails, threatening me that unless I took down this article, he was going to start legal action against me. And that he was being backed by the BBC. So at that point, having worked with the BBC, I contacted the BBC just to clarify whether they were supporting him what was the situation? 
And they got back to me saying, we know about Belfield. He has form. He's done this before. Don't worry. Just forget about it. And I did at that point. And then it came up till Easter. So this is between New Year and Easter. He he came on to me again in, in February when we had the episode with the Caroline Flack tweet where he tweeted how she died, that evening that she died, which obviously I knew Caroline and I didn't need to read. I just found out she died and I didn't really need to learn the method of her killing herself through a tweet by Alex Belfield. So I reached out to him and said, look, please just take that down. That is, like, have some respect for the people who knew her. He did take the tweet down, so obviously he acknowledged that it was inappropriate. After that, he then reared up again, attacking me, telling me to take down my original article about him. And again, by this point, I was being told by the BBC, by the police, by my parents, just to block and ignore him. I did that. I just tried to block. I tried to ignore him. He would then send me messages on Facebook, my personal Facebook, saying, have you seen this? Um, have you seen that I've emailed you? Um, again, because I wasn't responding to any of the emails. And then, like I say, by April is when it came around because he then started to target another theatre blogger called Stage Door Joe, who's a friend of mine. So he reached out to me in tears, like sobbing, saying that he'd been attacked by Alex Belfield, received all these emails. And I was like, Joe, this is exactly what he, he did to me. Like, think nothing of it. It's like, I was told to just block and ignore him. By this point, he didn't know what to think. Like, he was a new blogger himself. It, like, you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to kind of, like, risk legal action. So this is when, in April, I felt really bad because I felt like I'd enabled Alex Belfield. I felt like if I'd spoken out at New Year about what he'd done to me, then people would have been aware of it. So they would have not felt the way I had felt when I originally felt out. Because, and they've been assured that to just ignore him. So I kind of felt complicit in this whole scenario and responsible. So that's why I then posted another blog and made two videos my Twitter, just informing people that I had had this experience with Alex Belfield and that if they had experienced similar things, that they, they're they okay and not to worry and they can reach out to me if they want. And I got a lot of responses. Obviously, I keep them anonymous and kept them to myself, but there were a lot of people who had experienced similar situations of intimidation. It was intimidation. Receiving these emails, threatening legal action, None of them were founded. Like I say, there was nothing to back. Like he was saying he'd been to the police. He was saying that he'd reported us to the police, that he'd started legal action. In one email, he pretended he'd copied in a solicitor. And that solicitor didn't exist. It was all fabrication. Which is just crazy when you think back to it. Like even now, when I, it just blows my mind when I think back to it. I'm like, because at the time, you kind of... Is this real? Like, I don't know. I can't determine what's not. Dude, that's, that was his method. That was his MO. But is this when it, it took a darker turn? Yeah, so this was in Easter when, like I say, he kind of then ramped it up to the next level. And obviously this was just the beginning of lockdown. So I was living... I am HIV positive, so I was told to, by medical advice, to get out of London if you can. My parents lived in Cumbria, so I was shielding in Cumbria, um, and everybody was locked down. We we didn't know how long it was going to last. It was going to be a couple of weeks. We had Easter. We had my birthday during lockdown. We had my mum's 65th birthday, so it was all a bizarre time, and obviously the theatre industry had imploded and there's me as a theatre blogger thinking I don't really have a purpose now I like what am I supposed to do like how long is this gonna last like as a HIV man like is this going to catch up on me like am I gonna die so 
So there was a lot going on in my head. And then Alex kind of preyed on that. He kind of like saw this kind of advantage to, to then really dig in. And he then he then started making videos about me. And he would scrutinize. He would go back over previous videos. Like I made at that point, I did weekly vlogs. So like each week I would do a funny intro. And if I had been to see a pantomime, I might throw on a friend's princess dress to introduce the video. What Alex did was go back to these videos, would screenshot these pictures of me in a dress, and then would open his videos with, well, this guy's clearly mentally ill. Look at him. And there would be me in a princess dress. So he he drew that connection of like, well, I must be mentally ill if I'm a cross-dresser. Um, and that was the alarming thing. That was the point where it just tipped because I was like, he's actually attacking me for being gay. Um, and that was the worrying thing because I, I could probably take that on the chin or shoulder it. But what I realized was these videos were going out to m many, many thousands of people. And if there are people out there who are struggling with their identity and sexuality, seeing somebody being attacked and described as mentally ill because they're wearing a dress. Um, is this, that's when I, like say, reached out to the police. When, when you were shielding, was this when you were with your parents? Yeah. So from, from the, the minute, I like to say, from when lockdown happened in mid-March, um, I was already at my parents and I was kind of grounded there. Like I say, I still had an apartment in Clapham, which I was paying for. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't leave because we were told to stay where we were. Um, so yeah, so I, I was then marooned at my parents' house. What did he do to your mum? So that came a few days later. So basically what happened with Alex exhausted his attempts to get through to me he was by this point he'd emailed me every day he was then tweeting me he was then this was all through my channel that stage of blog he then moved and targeted me directly um sending me messages through facebook um again i just as by the police and ignore told by my parents block and ignore I thought just just blocking and ignore. Um, he would then find a new way to target me. So he then found my parents' phone number and rang my well, rang to speak to my dad. And my mum answered. I was home at the time, which I don't think he realised. Um, so my mum came through. Obviously, my mum and I are very close. So like, I told her about Alex Belfield and what was going on. But, I mean, she might not have known, but she took the call and she, I guided her as she listened for this 25-minute conversation where Alex was telling her that he was going to take legal action against me and that I was in serious trouble, that I was going to be arrested. And none of this was true because I, I hadn't done what he was saying. And my mum was challenged. My mum's a very smart woman. And she was challenging him because he was on the phone to say, but your son lied about me. He's, he's posted these lies. And my mum challenged and said, well, what were the lies? What did he say about you? And he couldn't answer because he didn't have an answer. So she really kind of like backed him into a corner. And then he just, like I say, after 25 minutes, hung up. At that point, he then disappeared um posted and exposed at this point he'd already revealed jeremy vine's address online mm -hmm. he had a phone in where if he was disgruntled with a caller he would read out their phone number he would then post their phone numbers on twitter so there's me at my parents house knowing that he has my parents address and phone number and had recorded this I didn't, well, I didn't know he had recorded the conversation. I just know that he'd rang my mom. And then he posted a tweet saying that he was going to do this expose, this big reveal about me later that day on YouTube. So I'm like contacting my solicitor and contacting the police saying he's about to post this video about 
this conversation he's had with my mum, what can you do? And they were like, well, you can't do anything until he's done it. So, and I'm fearful at that time thinking, he is going to read out their address. He's going to read out their number. So obviously my dad comes home from work that day and he, and like we have this huge, I mean, they're a different generation. They're in the late sixties. So he's saying like, I bring it, I brought it on myself. It was all my own fault. Like I must have like done something to like annoy him. Like why else was he targeting me? Um, Did you believe that at this point he was orchestrating to destroy your life? Yeah. Because he wasn't, this is the thing, like, I was being told to block and ignore. And I was doing that. Like, I was literally blocking it. And he was finding new ways to get to me. And like I say, he was then to ring my mum instead of trying, like, fight, like, by all means, try and find my number. Call me. But why why call my mum? That was just so weird. And, like, to this day, she still feels bad because what then went on, basically, he did go live later that evening. and he. He didn't play the video. He blackmailed me, saying that he would play the video unless I took down the article about him. And then he basically misquoted and took out of context everything that my mum had said. So she joked about, like, well, if he's done it, chop his head off. Like, my mum's from Accrington. She's a typical Yorkshire lass. And she was just, like, having a bit of banter with it. But he took that as, like, an actual quote. His son, she said, chop his son's head off. So there was all this. And she then felt really bad thinking, like, I said the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. I'm I'm so sorry. And, like, even she then later had to then make a witness statement that went to court. She was invited to give evidence at court, which she obviously turned down because there was no way I was going to let my mum have to subject it to that and speak up in court and come to Nottingham to give evidence at 68 years old. There was no way I was going to put her through, through that. Um, so we managed to, like, do it without her her needing to come. But that was the point. At that, at that point, yeah, like, I, I didn't know what his next move was going to be. He And like I say, threatening to play the entire bit. I was genuinely concerned that he was going to reveal the address. I remember having a conversation with the police where they... they <laughs> They offered to install some security cameras. And I was like, I'm not concerned. Like, it's a little lockdown. I don't think he's going to turn up on the doorstep. But he might incite other people. And this is what Jeremy said when Jeremy Vine had the same problem. When when his address was revealed by Alex Belford, he was concerned. to come and that was the concern and that was the worry and like I say this was during lockdown when people had a lot of time on their hands so how did this affect your, your parents you haven't your mum's spoken to Belfield on the phone you haven't mentioned your dad how did this affect your parents devastating like I say my mum felt my parents are both very protective of me and this entire situation like I say they they kind of couldn't get their heads around it because it was like, well, who is this guy? Like, why is he attacking you? And it's that kind of victim shaming thing where I was like, honestly, I've not done anything. Like, he's just, I don't, I don't know why he's doing this. So they were kind of like, they were trying to reconcile with what it was. And obviously I was saying, well, I'm, I've been in touch with the police. And at that point, even Fred, close friends were saying, why are you contacting the police? Why are you wasting their time? I was like, because this is serious this is not going to go away and obviously my my dad's advice was just block and ignore which he later did apologize for like after the court case because even at that point i didn't know what else he had done until the trial i didn't know who else he'd done stuff like this to the extent of it and i think the trial really kind of vindicated me and vindicated a lot of people so then afterwards I was able to like demonstrate to my parents, like, this was real. This actually happened. So I think my dad then kind of did a U-turn and said, like, you were right. Like, he was not going to stop. He was not going to go away. So blocking, ignoring him wouldn't have worked. And like I say, my mom just felt awful because she felt like she'd, she'd done the wrong thing or she'd said something stupid. 
because then Belfield misquoted her and took it out of context and then used it against her. Um, they were both, they're very private people. And this is why this whole thing, even now, me talking openly about it is, is very difficult because I am as equally protective of them as they are of me. And obviously, I don't want to have to talk about the fact that like this did richer our family. Like, if you imagine this is lockdown, we're stuck in a house together. They're in their sixties. I'm coming up to forty. Years and then suddenly being rooted back at home when the world is just gone mad anyway <laughs> because we're in a global pandemic. It was a difficult time for everybody and to try and kind of navigate through this while all this other stuff was going on was incredibly uncomfortable. And obviously we, we spent days after this this phone call where we had this huge argument where my parents and I didn't speak because I felt bad that I brought this to on their doorstep and they just didn't know how to react to it and respond to it. And it took a long time. It took one or two years to fully recover from that and for us to really kind of get back on track and how did all of this affect you i was devastated like i'd say i'm i remember that night where after the, the phone call like up to that point i could i could shoulder it because it was just about me but when he started to impact and i was out like i couldn't control it i couldn't con um, I was devastated. And like I say, my whole life had been taken away, like everybody's during lockdown. And I remember feeling so lost and so alone. And I just went out to a field and just sat under a tree and I cried my eyes out because there was nobody that I could reach out to because nobody could come and get me because I'm, we're, we're in lockdown. I couldn't just go to London because <laughs> we're in a lockdown. And I like I just remember that I just didn't want to be there. I just didn't want to be alive. And then the only thing that kept me here was HIV positive. I was diagnosed seven years ago, and that switched something in me. I think I realized at that point, if I'd been born 10, 20 years before that, I wouldn't be here. Thanks to the NHS and thanks to this incredible drug that I take once a day, that keeps me alive. Like, I felt it gave me a new appreciation for life. It gave me a new... It just made me a kinder person, a more kind of sensitive person, a more just grateful to be here. So even at that point where I was at my lowest in my life, I didn't see a way forward. I didn't see a way out of it. I just wanted to end it. The only thing that kept me coming, kept me going, was thinking, I've been given this second chance. Like I cannot throw away my life because I, I, I value it. I really, really do. So that is kind of what propelled me back off the edge. So we've got we've got a sense of what he's done to you so far. You've mentioned Caroline, and we'll 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 get to more of Caroline when we talk about. The trial itself yeah but how did you what was your part in the trial what was my part yeah well i mean this is the thing so i was the first person to publicly call out alex belfield for his behavior by that point he'd obviously been intimidating ben and obviously bernie but both of them kept quiet about it um so I was the first to kind of really bring it to people's attention. Um, and then obviously I, I had no idea. Like I say, at that point, uh, obviously people like Liz Green and Rosina had put complaints in, like behind the scenes. Because when I contacted the police, I was getting pushed aside. And there were, there were two things. So I contacted the police on my own accord, being Alex Belford is harassing me. What can I do? And they just told me, well, well, just block and ignore. And then the other side of it, he was telling me that he'd reported me to the police, which was all a fabrication. It was all his method of intimidation. So then I was ringing the police being like, 
um, Alex Belfield says that you've just contacted them about me. And then they're like, no, we don't know who you are. So, like, he hadn't. So it was bizarre. And then, obviously, by the time it, this was several months in, we're talking, like, October, when I first got a solicitor's letter, the first and only solicitor's letter I ever got on behalf of Alex Belfield, which claimed that I'd written something libel in my website, and I responded to it saying, what? What did I write? And I never heard back from it ever since. Um, so again, I, I mean, I don't know what that was. But at that point, I then contacted the police and said, look, you need to take this. Like, I don't feel protected. I felt right. like at that point, the other, I knew there was a case building. I knew that other witnesses, because at this point, we were all kind of connected. We all started to speak to each other. Um, and I knew they had given evidence and the case was building. But at that point, I wasn't. And at that point, they were protected by restraining orders. And I said, I need to be protected because I've just received this letter from a solicitor. So that is when I put in my complaint against Alex Belfin. And that's when I became. And initially, there was 11 of us. There was 11 witnesses that were going to go to court and give evidence. And it three people too much. Um, so they stepped aside. So it came down to eight of us. Um, but yeah, at that point, it was self-preservation. I, I think I kind of did it because I wanted to be protected by that restraining order. Um and I, I wanted just to kind of have vindication. I wanted, because he maintained that he was within the law and that he'd done nothing wrong. And I, I wanted a, a verdict. I wanted a judge and a jury to listen to me and to determine that it wasn't my fault. I didn't bring it on myself, that this was all wrong, that I was right, that, Belfield needed to stop, which is what I said all along. So that is why I kind of got involved in the trial. How did you, it's not really a feeling, but at this point, Alex Belfield's the fighter for freedom of speech. And he's saying, I'm going to have my day yeah. in court with the BBC and with Nottinghamshire police. And yet you was one of his victims waiting to get to the Crown Court. Yeah. And we couldn't say anything. That was the thing. We knew, like, we saw it continue. We saw his channel continue to grow. This is the thing. I think this is why Alex Belford is such an anomaly, because it was just an alignment of situations. Had lockdown not happened, had people not needed or had the time, even me, if I'm completely honest, if I had been busy in London, I don't think I would have been invested in this as much. I would have perhaps just kind of looked at it and shrugged it off. But because I was at home and because we were all locked down at home, he took this opportunity to kind of rise up. And he did. You saw his channel grow from like 20 to 400 over the course of lockdown. So it just goes to show that like people did respond to him and did need him in their lives he, he kind of capitalized on that situation so yeah when it was when all this was going on and we we knew that court case was coming up but there were restraining orders so at that point i felt protected i didn't feel that he was going to turn up on my door i didn't feel he was going to make any more videos about me because he couldn't but he continued to make videos and he continued to campaign that he was going to be suing the bbc and to canvas for money and donations and continue by that point he'd done the two gofundmes which were later found out to be fraudulent and he I, I mean i don't know whether the money was given back or not but they were shut down and that's when he moved on to the to the paypal so he was asking for this money but he was saying it was to sue the bbc which at that point it hadn't been announced that he'd been arrested it hadn't been announced that he was charged so it was all kind of bizarre that we kind of had this insight that we we knew he was going to court and that he was the one under criminal prosecution and then even then he didn't even use the money 
to defend himself. He defended himself. So it was... Which... Let me just get the sequence of events around the court the trial. I would presume that each complainant or witness would attend the court separately. So you wouldn't see the whole trial. You would just see your part of the trial. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so we weren't allowed into the court or to watch any of the court proceedings until we'd given evidence. After that point, you could, we could obviously, it's, they now have uh, cameras. So you can actually, you can, anybody, I think any, it's an open court. So anybody in the public can request a link to watch a trial. Obviously, we weren't allowed to until we'd given evidence. So I was the last person to give evidence. So in my case, I have no prior knowledge of any of the other witnesses or any of their accounts before I entered the court. And it was only after that that I was then able to like go back and refer back to their testimonies and determine what he'd done to other people. Like, I had no idea. Can you describe how the court was set up? Were there lots of people in the public gallery? Was it just defence barrister, prosecuting barrister? How was the court set up? Yes, I mean, this was... It was incredibly weird, because it was Nottingham for a start. Um, and we're, at this point, it was coming out of the original lockdown, and lots of court cases had been delayed or postponed, as ours did, um, and dates had been moved around, people's availability. You had eight witnesses that you had to then juggle. So that is ultimately going last. People had to then come first. Um, and we were given the option, I don't even know if I was asked or whether it was just imposed on me. Um, there is a situation where you've given special measures in a similar case where if, say, you're a victim of the rape and the rapist is, or the accused rapist is defending themselves, it's unimaginable that you would then have to answer their questions directly. So in any event like this, you are given special measures, which basically means a court-appointed barrister would be given to Alex to... He would still come up with the questions because he was representing himself but the questions would be delivered by a barrister on his behalf so that you wouldn't actually have to engage or interact with Alex. Um, further to this, you would so when you're in court, they would put a curtain across so you didn't actually have to see him. But it was a very thin curtain and I could hear everything that he was saying under his breath, grunting, disagreeing with. So obviously, we, like I say, this is, a first experience for me, like giving evidence in a criminal trial, when there's a jury of 12 people to my left, there's a judge. I remember that there was a microphone and you had to obviously talk into this microphone, but I'm so sure that like, I couldn't reach the microphone. So I had to like, So I gave two days of evidence on my feet um, with Alex Belfield just to the right of me behind a, a flimsy curtain, muttering under his breath. Um, and the other thing, like, so my parents didn't come because it was uh, too traumatic for them and it just didn't, couldn't put themselves through it. So that was hard to reconcile, to not have them there to support me. Um, my best friend did come, but he was unfortunately shielded by this curtain as well. So... Although I was, I didn't have to look at Belfield, I couldn't see my best friend. I couldn't see the person that come to support me. So I'm there alone, effectively. And you're told to kind of like answer your questions to the jury. But they're 12 strangers and you don't know how you're being perceived because you've got so much doubt in your mouth, especially with a cross examine where they make it feel... <laughs> they're designed to trip you up and they're designed to make it feel like you're to blame, that this was all your fault, you brought it on yourself. So when you're trying to, like, you're worried constantly about, like, how I'm saying things and how I deliver things. And obviously this was emotional. I'm talking about it three years later and I'm still emotional. But if you imagine this was two years after the event and I'm recalling very painful 
and I'm breaking down like two or three attempts. We had to stop because I was in floods of tears, and we had the court literally had to rest while I went away and had a break, and then came back and continued. And that happened for Bernie and Ben and Liz, and Jer- even Jeremy Vine, as resilient and incredible as he is, found it hard, and I broke down in tears at several occasions because. It was it was horrible to kind of, because this was and I will respect them for that. I know I didn't realize they were going to do this. They went through every single video and every email, every word ever exchanged between Alex and I was presented as evidence. I thought they might just pick up bits and pieces, so I had to relive every single minute of it, every video, every email, and then interjected with questions about it as I was reliving it. And like I say, a lot of it I didn't want to watch again because it is painful. Even now when I'm having to now put these videos together as as part of my campaign, it is so difficult to to go back over that stuff. Was Alex at this point, you said you had two days on the stand. Could you hear Alex speaking to his barrister who was then asking the questions of you? Yeah, you could hear him. And I also obviously had my friend in the gallery. He was relaying what was. And at this point, there'd been reports in newspapers, which I try not to read, but other people would read them and they'd tell me about, oh, it said that Alex was like this. So by all accounts, and from my own, from my own experience, I could hear him mutting and groaning and tutting any time I suggested something or said something. The most prominent thing was when he misquoted what I said about Kai and Flack. I did this whole video, which I think we've all seen by now, where I talked about Caroline being a victim of cyberbullying. And I said that Alex was a cyberbully. He then made many, many videos and sent me many emails and rang my mom saying that I called him a murderer, which I didn't. I never used the word murderer. I never suggested he was a murderer because. I, Caroline was a victim of a cyber bully. I don't, nobody murdered her. Like, I know that. And I certainly didn't suggest Alex Belfield was a murderer. But for him to then use that, and this is the thing. So, like, for a long time, I genuinely thought that he was just deliberately manipulating that and deliberately misquoting me. But what happened was when they played the video, he then responded, and I I could hear all this. He responded to my barrister saying, "That's not the that's not the video. He's he's changed it. He's edited out the video. The, he's edited out the bit where he called me a murderer. So he made the accusation that I doctored the evidence, and he's saying this within earshot of me. And the barrister had to say." I think it was a clerk. A clerk said, we haven't stopped, please stop talking. We haven't cleared the room. Because what, basically what would happen was that they would clear and then I would be able to leave. So he was saying all this right under my breath. as if, to, And that was bizarre because I can't, at, up to that point, I genuinely believe he was purposely m- misinterpreted me and was deliberately misquoting me. But in that moment, it, it seemed like he had convinced himself that that's what I'd said, or he genuinely believed it. Which, even when you look back at the video, because he used my video in clips, he used segments of the video in another video that he posted about me. So it's like you've seen the video, you re edited the video yourself, you know I didn't say that. Then why suddenly was it in your head that I did do that? Did the court make anything of him saying you've doctored the video? Because you, yeah. you said, I think the clerk said, we've not touched it. Yeah. So basically what had happened is I provided a effectively a compilation, a 90-minute video of all the bits where Alex Belfield had ever talked about me. And these were like segments of, you can imagine like he, he would do a 60-minute video and there'd be like two. So my compilation video was that. It was a compilation. He tried to present his case that it was all taken out of context and it was unfair. So as an example, to try and illustrate 
his point, they then played what... So there was a, a clip where I, I presented a two-minute section. They then presented the 30-minute full video, most of which didn't have any connection to the trial, just to illustrate that I was just using a portion of the... Fit. But all these clips were clearly labelled with the date and time that we... we like I say, we went through it chronologically and systematically. Like the, on this day, he said this. On this day, he said this. On this day, he said this. So it was all built up. There was no kind of trying to trick him up or put words in his mouth or take him out of context. It was all there. But yeah, we we had to go through that, jump through that hoop by presenting a thirty-minute clip just to appease him. A lot of people watching this have not done jury duty, let alone be cross-examined in the Crown Court. Yeah. Me what was it like being cross-examined on the stand? Horrendous. Awful. Like I said, this was a bit late. It was, this was about a year after I moved back to London. So obviously we'd had the two years of lockdown. I had <laughs> put on stone from living away. Um, I felt very isolated. I've been stuck marooned with my parents as lovely as it was to see them i remember wanting to come back to london and just one get back into shape and to meet some new people and i had to find somewhere to live so it was all kind of a, a lot going on and i found this incredible gym and i made some incredible friends um and i was there for about a year until the gym closed down on the week of my trial oh. so i'm there having to say goodbye, knowing that like all these people who I like the gym was my second home and I was seeing these people day in, day out and knowing that we would then all be sent to different gyms and we would never be together again. Um, it was really hard. And then, like I said, at that, just at that moment, I then have to go and give evidence. And like I say, because of the way it was configured, and things moved around. I didn't know which day I was presenting evidence. I had to like literally keep a two-week period free. So you're kind of... And at that point, I've not fought out the case for a year. I've been protected by the restraining order. I was trying to get on with my life. But obviously, you, you, you want to prepare. So like I then had to sit through all the videos myself before going to the court case so that I was ready to answer questions about them. Um, and like I said, I didn't realise they were going to then make me. So I, like I said, prepared for them and then had to wait two days because actually they can't see you on Monday because Jeremy needs to do Monday. So you're going to come on Friday. So And you just all kind of kept moving around and then you get called up and you're like, you're on tomorrow. And you're like, huh? And like I said, you just don't know what you do because I remember... <laughs> You, you remember when you see televised trials yeah. and you see commentary and you think, and people talk about the way someone's presented or like if they said something and they just laugh at the wrong time and you're thinking, oh, d don't laugh inappropriately. Or like, like even when I've been presenting my, there's a lot of victim shaming going on at the moment. And even when I talk now about this experience, I get comments where they're like, well, you just laughed about that. Can't be that upset about it. And you kind of think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing because it's just so bizarre, but not because it didn't impact me. So you're kind of constantly aware of like how you're presenting yourself, how you're saying things. The cross-examination was difficult because obviously you're being challenged. Like obviously with the barrister, they're on your side. They're kind of trying to like present your story with the cross examine they're trying to trip you up. And I I was told, <laughs> my best friend told me afterwards, he was like, you came off really sassy. Because this is the thing, like, although I am a victim, and I will always say I was a victim of in this scenario, I did stand up to myself. And I did, I want to be recognised for that confidence and that courage. Like, I don't want to be seen as a victim and a pushover. So, like, yeah, if I'm being challenged and if I think something's wrong and I know they're asking me stupid questions, I wanted to stand up for myself. So it was difficult because obviously you don't want to then 
piss off a barrister or piss off the judge or yeah. piss off the jury. But ultimately, I said, I said, piss, sorry. Um, ultimately. We've been going like an hour, you're fine. <laughs> but that's the thing. You just, you, you're worried about how you're going to be perceived and misinterpreted in some cases. But ultimately, you want to present yourself in a strong and confident way because this is the thing that I, 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 I do. I'm very proud. Like People keep saying to me, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through this? And a lot of it is, and some of the recognition and response has been incredibly kind and incredibly supportive. But it is because I want people to recognise and feel empowered to stand up to people. And if you see some, because I was told, I was told by the police, I was told by my parents, block and ignore. Like, it doesn't, like, ignore it as if it didn't matter. So I think what I really kind of want out of this is just to give people that power to stand up for themselves and to not feel bullied or victimized yes obviously it's it's horrid and i will never ever put this on anybody else like what i've been through it is hard like i'm not gonna sit here and be like oh yeah i just it was fine because it wasn't it was horrendous and the the impact you recognize you're putting on other people my friends my family or who not just me going through this it's them they're the ones having to read about themselves in the papers as well as me so you've got you're shouldering all that guilt as well but i do it because i want people to know that ultimately if if i had not done anything if i just sat down and walked away alex belfield would not have been put in prison and jeremy pointed this out very astutely he would have carried on until somebody had died yeah Bernie already said that he was driven to the end. Like I, like say, I mean, I had reasons why I managed to talk myself back up the edge, but I don't know who else he would have targeted after us because that was the thing. Like we were all granted restraining orders, so then he'd just move on to other people. Mm -hmm. Like he was relentless, mm -hmm. and he would just continue and keep going and keep going. And even in a statement he posted the day he was sentenced, declaring that he sleeps well at night and that he will be back, and this is not the last you'll see of him. I mean, how do you see with that? Like, just it's incredible. Just man Sorry, Philip, it's just managing the narrative. That's what he did through the whole trial, and it was, it was very obvious to see. As a complainant, one of many, how yeah. did you feel when he said, when Alex Belfield stood up in court and said, I haven't got the money for a legal team, and it's a witch hunt, infamy, infamy, They've all got it in for me. Actually, I'm the victim. How did that make you feel? Oh, I mean, he said this all along. It was a lot of it was projection. Like even in the videos, when you look now, reflectively, like when he was picking on me for being gay, but then later came out as part of the LGBT community, and the stuff that he said, it was it was all projection. Like he's obviously got these problems about himself and the way he would describe our response to what he was doing was exactly what he was, his behavior. So it was, it was all bizarre, but with, I, to this day, I can't reconcile whether at what point the penny dropped, at what point he, if he, if it even did, like, I don't know. In the morning that he got sentenced and he posted this video saying that he, he fell quite zen and that like he was prepared i don't know if he literally went into that court knowing that he was not going to come out that he was not going to go home that he was going to be in prison for five and a half years because it'd been suggested that he would be custodial and that he needed to prepare for it but i don't know if psychologically he did prepare himself i still think to this well no i do know because at this day he still has not acknowledged what he'd done we wouldn't be here now if he had. Like, if he recognised what he had done to me, he would have settled my claim. But he obviously doesn't. So even now, even though he's been judged by a jury and given a custodial centre and is now in jail for what he did, he clearly doesn't think he did anything wrong. And that's the remarkable thing, where, like, all along through this, it just felt cocky that, like... He, he felt he didn't need a barrister because 
He didn't do anything wrong. He was just telling the truth. But this is the thing. It was the distortion. And that's why I can't get my head around whether on some levels I felt he was manipulating things. But on some levels, I think he believed it himself. He'd like, like I say, with the Caroline Flack quote, it was an example that he generally did believe that. Like he, he went from, perhaps he distorted it deliberately, manipulated the situation, but by the end, he generally had convinced himself that that's what I'd said when I didn't. Did that and in the manipulation, same, did that shock you about a personal friend? No, because I, like I say, from, from day one, the, the whole, his whole campaign against me was based on his opinion that I had posted something liable about him, which was proven in court that he was mistaken. It was said to be mistaken, that he was wrong. But even, like I say, even at every point where he was confronting my mum and she challenged him and said, well, what did he say? Because obviously all the emails where he's informing me that I'd said something, I couldn't then go back to him and be like, well, what did I say? And it was only when I got the official letter from a solicitor when I went back to that and I did respond to the solicitor and said, can you tell me what I posted that was liable? And I got no response. So, like, even at that point, like, I knew, like, there was, there was no founding to any of this. But whether, like I say, whether Alex believes that to this day, day he might still be sat there thinking that and i believe i think he is i think that's why he won't apologize or acknowledge what he did to me because he still thinks he's done nothing wrong and that is worrying did you expect him at the end of the trial when the judge said it's going to be a custodial sentence and he had a month to get all of his affairs in order did you expect him to be sent to jail no we we didn't know. This was the thing. So like I remember we obviously as a, as a as witnesses, we weren't allowed to speak to each other or talk to each other um until we all given evidence. As soon as we had, we then formed a WhatsApp group. And to be fair, it was incredible because I nobody knows what we went through apart from each other. Um so to ha we didn't know how to navigate this. We were obviously getting a lot of press attention, um and we didn't know what we could say, what we can do. So to have that kind of group come together and support each other um, was incredible and very, very valuable. So we were speaking constantly between the sentencing, well, between the, the ruling and the sentencing. Um, and then on the day of the sentencing, we obviously all were invited to have access to the court via a video link. I was filming, so I couldn't log in because I was busy. Um, Ben was logged in. Um, I think the others found it too painful and they just didn't want to know, didn't want to watch. They just wanted to wait and, and find out. Obviously, Ian Lee did a, a live video, <laughs> which was incredible, where he showed his reaction. Yeah, with relief. But yeah, at a point where they obviously they presented his um, character witnesses and they were so favourable and so glowing. And this is what I, I will say this right now because I'm not going dis to discount this at all. I was challenged by somebody who saw one of my videos recently and said, Alex Belfort is a good man. And my, my, my friend and my parents keep saying don't don't respond don't react but i encourage a conversation if you if, if you want to talk to me and understand because like i said a lot of people just don't have an insight or don't fully understand the situation so they will just put out an opinion without anything to back it up so i'm actually quite prepared to like talk through something and talk through an opinion if you have a, a different opinion to me so this guy who said alex belford's a good man i asked him why do you think that and he explained to me, which I do honestly recognise and do really, really appreciate, that for a lot of people, Alex Belfield was a source of comfort. He was a source of entertainment throughout lockdown. Like I say, we were all very isolated. We, and he was somebody, a focal point, someone that they tuned into every day. 
And I don't know if like if it's Stockholm like I'm not going to excuse Alex his general behaviour or his, who he is but I do acknowledge and I do recognise that for a lot of people he did provide comfort and entertainment and support and just got them through lockdown so like that was the thing when when I was listening to these character witnesses I didn't discount them. I, I believe that he wasn't, like, he did sing in, in caring homes. Like, he did care about his family, that he had these people that worked with him, that relied on him. I didn't take that for granted at all. Um, so when they were, these were being read out, you are kind of, I mean, they're designed to do that. They're designed to kind of present an argument, why should he not go to jail? So when they're reading these out, you are sat like kind of being swayed by it, being like, and I remember Ben in particular was like, he's going to get off. He's going to get off. Um, so it was only when, and like say, even when the, <laughs> when the judge started speaking, we weren't exactly sure where he was going with it until he, he kind of said, and we were like, oh my God, that's, that's, that means he's de- that's a sentence, right? Um, so yeah, like I said, all this is being relayed by WhatsApp because I'm not actually watching the live feed. Ben is. Um, so yeah, it was it was a weird, weird day. And I remember stepping off. And that was the first time I spoke about it because I hadn't, like obviously I was very, very considerate that I wanted a fair trial um, and I wasn't going to speak about him until until that verdict came through and even after we were like so until it was sentenced um i didn't i didn't post anything and i remember posting an instagram story just with like i say kind of it was more vindication because it wasn't satisfaction that he'd gone to prison because i still had i still have sympathy for him like i don't i wouldn't wish that on anybody like i still i am still compassionate but for me, that represented that, especially for all the people, including my parents who and the police who said I brought it on myself or that I should have just blocked and ignored, to get that vindication and that validation that look out look what else he did. It wasn't just me. Um that was overwhelming more than anything. So I think that was my first, the wave of emotions that came after we were sentenced. So we've been going quite a while, Philip. Uh, I've got a few more questions I want to ask you. But, yeah, yeah. Um, everybody that's commenting, I thank you for all the comments. Uh, if you have any questions for Philip, please ask him in the comments and I'll ask them of Philip. Um, as I say, we've been going quite a while and this is not easy for Philip at all. So there's been over 400 people viewing this so smash the like, hit the filmy thing. It's hard to condense. That's the thing. It's it's there was so much. You forget, when people talk about it, it's like he did this for over ten years. Yeah. And in my case, it's three years of my life now. So like it's it is hard to condense into like an hour. So like I'm I'm sorry that we're kind of going on. No, 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 no. I I, I want to get to the cruelty yeah. because people, many people, have said it was just hurty words. I want them to understand that this was not just 30 words. Now, you said you were diagnosed HIV positive seven years ago. Yeah. And it was Alex Belfield that announced that to the world. And that should have been your decision in your time to the people that you chose. Yeah. And people... Katie Hopkins has been very vocal about it just being hurty words and it is victim shaming because obviously you especially when you acknowledge like Katie said, Well, I, I I don't really know about the full case. I don't know what else he did. I just know that he posted a few videos. It's like and this is what I say about all these videos that have been posted about unless you've studied the entire case and know every element to it, and like, you don't even need to, you just there is a the judge put together a nice summary for everybody to read. And you just need to read that. Like, I prefer anybody who now challenged me to say, well, what did he really do? And I was like, just read it. It's quite extensive, because obviously there's eight witnesses. 
but yeah, in my case, like this is the weird thing, and I think Black Belt Barrister does a video about this about the definition of stalking and how we came to that conclusion. Um, and there is a code of conduct, which is obviously this is where Belfield fell down essentially. In a code of conduct, if you believe you're protecting yourself, for example, Belfield generally believed that I had libeled him and produced this article. So a code of conduct, basically, by him emailing me more than two times can be considered harassment, unless he's protecting himself, which is what he felt he was doing. So if ordered to carry on that code of conduct... He And that would have been okay because that's following a course of conduct. But what he did, what he deviated from, was then once he exhausted that, and once I wasn't replying to any of these emails, he then contacted me on Facebook or contacted me on Twitter, which then moved to contacting me by my parents and emailing my parents and then ringing my parents and then finding out their number. And then obviously, all the time he's making these videos. And then he would find, this is where he went even further, which is why I don't think he's a good person. He then found out things about me from my past and then emailed my parents about him and blackmailed me. So again, with the HIV thing, it was something that he felt, because I wasn't publicly out, it was something he could exploit. And Nobody should feel like that. This was a problem when it was first when he first used it over me. At that point, I'd been living with the condition six years, and each person is different. It takes a long time to you can for it to sit with you, but that's your own process. And no, like people come out sooner or later your choice and I think for Bell to kind of push me into that situation where I had to come out because he referred to it in his two videos that he published was just inhumane like on any level and also at that point in my situation in particular he just made me feel ashamed because I the reason that I before I came out I was interviewed by the Guardian newspaper and they put me on the spot and said, like, well, what's this about him trying to out you for being HIV positive? And I was like, huh? And then they said, well, do you want us to leave this out of the article? And I'm like, if I say leave it out of the article, I am reinforcing that stigma. I am just as bad as I'm acknowledging that stigma and reinforcing it. So at that point, I was like, I can't, I can't ask you to leave it out of the article. I'm not ready to come out about it. And I don't know if I would have been ready, but there was no way I could leave it out like, or ask a paper to, to censor it. Uphold that stigma. So it pushed me to into this place where I wasn't ready to do it. And I, like I said, I just don't, Nobody is entitled to, to do that to somebody else. That's where he crossed so many. And this was, this was after the trial. This was like, I'd given my two days of evidence. Um, he found out during the trial that I was HIV. They were asking why why I was shielding and my parents, why I was there. And I felt it was important to tell them. I was like, well, I'm HIV positive. I, I had no choice. I was advised to, to shield. He then used it in his closing argument as his defense, saying he felt sorry for me because I was living with this long term condition. And obviously, he would, he would never have harassed me because he, he knew about this. And I'm like, you didn't know about it, though. And the same with the, with the gay thing. He tried to claim that he's not homophobic because he, he's part of the community. And I'm like, <laughs> I've got. The receipts. I've got every single video where you said something derogatory, homophobic, some slur. I mean, there's even a, a, a Jewish slur in there, and I'm not Jewish, so I don't know where he was just plucking these out of. He just seemed to try and find the most offensive things that he could throw at you for no accord that would stick.
A couple of questions for you, Philip, yeah. from the, the people commenting. I'm going to I'm going to round the interview off to ask you about the the Sunday Mirror article today, um, and what the response has been. Yeah. But I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, someone has asked, um, "Have you had therapy after the trial, and did you benefit from it?" Yeah, um, yeah, um, that's the thing because obviously, so when I was diagnosed with HIV positive, I felt very fortunate. I felt that um, my parents were very supportive. I told them straight away. I told my friends. Um, I was diagnosed seven years ago, so it was no longer a death sentence. Um, so I just got on with it. I knew that, like, I think as well. I I didn't have to put. I had only slept with one person. So I didn't have to produce a list of people that I might have contacted. Um, so for me, it was quite an untraumatic event in my life. Um, but I still had insecurities about it. I still sat there thinking, I'm never going to find someone who loves me back or this is going to this is gonna be a problem in my life. Um, so it's, it is something that I, I tried to reconcile with, but I didn't feel at the time that I needed therapy um because i felt i had enough support um and then during and even after the trial during the trial well during the harassment i reached out to a fantastic company called gallup who specialized in people who are attacked based on their sexuality um so they were incredible which I think people don't realise. Um, when I was obviously when he was posting these videos about my sexuality or whatever, and I was obviously complaining to YouTube, they were so unhelpful. You would have to then defend your case. So basically, they would then ask you to prove your ID. So you'd be back and forth emailing them. They would then ask you for specific lines and specific timestamps. So you would have to not only hear the video firsthand then have to re-watch it to produce a stamp code that you can then send to YouTube to get them to take it down. And then they come back to you and say, well, actually, no, it's just free speech. We'll leave it up there. And then you then take it to the police, who then again say, well, can you tell us where it is? So then they want a copy of it. So you have to then produce it to give to the police. And then, like I say, even now, I'm having to produce these videos and go back over it all again. So all through that, it's horrendous and it so like say this this company Gallup and there's a brilliant woman I can't say her name but because she, she helped me um so they helped me throughout that um the Terence Higgins Trust were the most incredible um so they're HIV they're the leading HIV charity um when I wanted to end it all um I reached out to them and <laughs> They, um, the London Man, which I was concerned about my weight, I'd obviously put on this two stone. So they felt this was a good goal that this is something I could I could be entered into the marathon. I'd never done a marathon. Um, I'd run five k, but never any further. And obviously, due lockdown, I've got nothing else to do. I can like go out and run. Um, so they gave me this place in the marathon and a two grand target to raise money. And, and it, it felt like I was giving back because I felt so privileged and fortunate of my situation being HIV and still being here. Um, I, I did. I wanted to give back. I wanted to help other people. So they were incredible and they supported me throughout that. And then most recently, so when I decided I was going to come out they helped me through that and they put me on this scheme called Positive Voices where just we did it as a cohort so we I had peers like other people to like talk to and share my experience with um and then it essentially the, the positive voices is a program where i of this group now go into schools and organizations and talk about what 
be whether it, to a class full of 14 year olds or to a bunch of people working at Amazon. Um, and it really it gives you that ownership and that empowerment because that was the thing up until that point. Although I was living with it and I hadn't acknowledged it and I hadn't really worked through the trauma or the how it was. Um, so to then have that mentor that was paid for and provided by Terry Higgins Trust, this incredible charity, um, they they saved my life. Like I say, they they got me off my ass. Like I say, when I something to, gave me a purpose, it gave me value. Um, and even now, like I say, like this opportunity to go, I, I didn't have that. When I was 14 at school, we didn't have people coming explain what HIV, if we had, I get it. But like, to, to have that opportunity now to like help other people is incredible. And that's why I said like, and I, I do, this is my pledge throughout all this. So all the money I am raising now for my legal fees, as you know, ultimately, if Alex Belfield is ordered to pay back those legal fees, I will donate every single penny that I've raised through Crowd Justice to Terrace Higgins Trust. And I mean that. Like, so I, when people are accusing me of money grabbing or doing this for, for the money, I'm honestly not. I'm really... I wouldn't put myself through that. Do you want to give you a couple of comments? We, we will... Yeah. Um, everyone that's um, staying with... Uh, this live stream, we will give you the details of how you can support Philip in his fight for an apology from Alex Belfield. We will give you those details. But I, I just want to read some of the comments that are coming through for you, Philip. Um, BCTV, we at the Tainted Blood community understand your fight against HIV, Philip. The Saints, number one, you get a heart. Chalky White, you get a heart. Vivian Kenyon, you get a heart. Chocolate frenzy, you get a heart. And um, someone said, uh, w was, would be interested to know your take on Alex Belfield's sexuality. And they ask if, do, do you believe that he's a bitter gay man? Um, he's not happy in his sexuality and he was bitter because he was seeing you as a man happy in himself. I'm not a psychiatrist. I will never be begin to understand what promotes up Alex's behaviour. As as an observation, I recognise that having worked at the BBC, he does have this vendetta, which is obvious. I mean, he, he set up a, a campaign to defund the BBC. I've always felt with Jerry, he targeted him because he felt jealous. He saw Jeremy as somebody who had the career that he felt he wanted or that he deserved. Um, and with me, I, I do believe I'd previously worked at the BBC and I was now working as a theatre blogger, which is what he was trying to align himself as. Um, with the sexuality thing, it's really interesting because I knew about it. Like I was told by a friend that when all this was happening, and I was getting all this uh, abuse targeted at me from my legs for, for my sexuality. A friend of mine said, but he's gay. Seen him on a gay dating app. He's contacting me before. And then somebody else said that, and showed me messages that, Jer like, that Alex had sent him, inviting him to his home in Nottingham. And I was like, Oh, so in my head, it makes it worse. When you've got somebody who is defiantly attacking you for your sexuality, but knowing that they're gay, it just blows your mind because then you kind of, what? And especially, like I say, this was the when I was giving my evidence and the whole time that I was presenting my evidence and talking about how it felt, to receive this homophobic abuse and these attacks, I kept my mouth shut because I'm like, I'm not gonna out him because I'm not that person. So like, I thought I could have gone on to say what I wanted to say, which my testimony would have been 
it was bad enough to have somebody attack me for my sexuality. It was even worse to have somebody attack me who is gay themselves. Can you imagine that paradox? So, like, I wasn't going to sit there and out him. So, like, I didn't, out of respect and out of courtesy. And then to have him use it in his defence, citing it as a, a reason why he can't be homophobic because he is part of the LGBT community. I was like, wow, I can't believe you went there. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, to this day, this was me. Like, I don't know, part of his bravado, part of his act, as he, like, he, he talked about being a womanizer. Certainly, I, this is the thing, like, you know him better than me. Like, you've known him for 20, 25 years. I don't know him. And I purposely have never, like, I only ever talk about what he did to me. I never talk about what he did to other people or what, because I don't know. Like, I don't know to this day why he left the BBC. Or what went on there? Because, or like, how many other court cases he has? Because it was before my time. And again, with the sexuality thing, it's not for me to determine whether he is or he isn't, or he's got a problem. All I'm doing is citing the fact that, like, he was homophobic. And like, you, <laughs> you can't dismiss it. Like, I've, I've, I've started to present the videos when you watch them back, and you're like, and even now, like, having acknowledged that, when you watch them back, knowing that he's gay himself or bisexual or whatever he identifies as when you watch him back and you see that's what makes it harder because i've said this from the from day one part of it wasn't me standing for myself like i say i could take that on a chin i can try and shoulder and obviously it's hurtful it's like when someone calls you mincer it taps into your insecurities like i i'm a typical gay man like i don't want to be demi because I'm I'm gay and like it's hurtful, but when he said the kind of transphobic things about me cross dressing and being mentally ill for wearing a dress, as somebody who is not ha, does not have a problem with my gender identity, my heart went out to everybody out there who might have seen that video, and that's why this whole thing is. It's not about what he said to me. It's never been about that. It's about the impact. The, the wider scale. He had 400,000 subscribers. Those videos were online for a long time. Like anybody could have seen them. Anybody, I mean, we don't know the impact he's had. We will never know. Like it, all it takes is one person to have seen one of those videos and seen somebody being persecuted for their sexuality and for it to really, really impact their lives. And that is exactly why I stood up to him. And why I'm proud Come of more questions. Sunday Mirror article today. What's the response been? Uh, Sunday Mirror and Mail Online today. What's the response been? This is interesting because obviously, building up to this, I I, I I didn't speak out for a year since the trial. Um, obviously, I instructed a with the intention of getting the videos taken down that were about my section, my, me being HIV positive. That was my intention. Um, Down with that, the, the story was going to break about Jamie Vine's apology. So I, I had that opportunity to, to consider whether this was the, the time that I needed to come out. And at that point, I'd spent £4,000 of my own money. I had a grand and a half bill to pay off, regardless of whether I walk away and say goodbye to what, like, I still have to pay that grand and a half. The next stage we can talk about later. I possibly have to raise 15 grand to, to continue this case. But either way, I have to raise a grand and a half to pay off my existing bill. Um, and I've got credit card bills now. Like, I, I can't afford to do that. Um, so that was, it took a lot of time to decide whether I was going to do all this. Um, I obviously considered all the witnesses because this isn't about me. This is dredging it up for them. And I'm very aware of the impact it has on them. Um, so I, I spoke to all of them individually. I then spoke to my parents about the impact it would have on them if I start interviews out. Because that interview is loaded. And that was the thing. It has not only, it talks about the rift between me and my parents, which is resolved now. And like say, my, my dad sat on his 70th. Me and my brother were there. It was a lovely week. But 
they're a very private family. They don't want me like nobody wants their son to like go to the Sunday mirror and talk about a rift that we had and also talking about suicide like I don't know if that will ever come back to, to bite me like I don't know whether in the future it might impact a relationship or it might impact uh, an employer who who knows that I was one suicidal or you don't know so that was all stuff that I had to consider before I even did it um, so it wasn't, like I say, none of this was because I wanted attention or because I'm doing the money or because I had, I just felt like it. Um, it has all been kind of decided and my solicitors worked with me on everything that I put out. Um, it kind of has been orchestrated. Um, and obviously the, Brilliant. Karen Boyle did an incredible job. She previously interviewed Liz Green. So again, it's that trust. Like I said, the, the reason I speak to you is because I trust you um, with my story. Because like no. I said, this is not a soap opera. This is my life. And Thank my you for taking life. part this evening. So, I just want to encourage everyone went. to um, get us through 150 likes. Smash the thumb, the thummy thing, the likes, just to acknowledge uh, Philip and his courage for actually coming on a a YouTube live's not easy, and especially when you've got people ask someone asking a very pointed question. Um, can you go through how people can support you with um, your attempt to get an apology out of Alex Belfield? Where can they go to, Philip? Um, I did get one troll who sent me a message on Facebook, a direct message on Facebook, saying that I was... And, I was lose. and offensive tweet, which, like, I mean, he's a troll, but that's the thing, like, and because he's sent to me privately, I can't even publish that and name and shame him because I would then be in breach. So, yeah, but that's how that's... But generally, people have been very supportive. But how can they support um, you, Philip? How, how can they support have... you with your trying to raise money to, to get a, an apology out of Alex Belfield. Where can they go yeah. to? Is there a, a link on your uh, YouTube yeah. channel, or do you want it's me to put everywhere. a link on this? Like, you can put a link on here, um, but all, like, my own social networks at Philip Dehaney, um, they all see that. Um, I can say the 1,500 is the initial target, just to bring me up to date, to pay off the debt that I owe to the solicitors. The next stage will be to raise 10 to 15 grand. And, like, this is the thing. And I will say this right now. Like, at any point, Alex Belfield, Alex Belfield is the one that has all the power in here. He, at any point, can make all this go away by just setting it. But ultimately, what he's doing is dragging his heels. And ultimately, this is going to cost him. Because the next stage is they basically prepare the trial defense because he's literally for stalking me so how can you defend the notion that he harassed me so at that point he won't be able to present a defense uh, the trial will be thrown out. He will then be ordered. He will either have to settle or be ordered to settle. And then he will have to pay all my legal fees back. So all this money that is raised, I mean, I can't go. In. But like I said, I've already pledged like every penny I win back, I will give to the Thomas Higgins Trust. And that will come out of Alex Belfield's pocket. So like if anybody sat there who has given to Alex Belfield in the past, and is wondering how the only this is the only way we can get the money back out of his pocket. Philip, the sorry, Philip, the feed's starting to break up quite badly now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the uh, the live to a conclusion. Um, thank you to everyone that's commented. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds 
Um, a lot of people very supportive of everything that you're doing, Philip. They're all saying. I will go back and read them all. Brilliant. They're all saying thank you. I'll I'll leave it open for a little while. If you want to leave a comment for Philip, please do so now, and we'll um, Philip will be able to read it over uh, the next few days or so. Philip, thank you. Thank you for allowing us this insight. It, it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Thank, thank you. you for thank being you. our inaugural um, interview on the channel. We've never done it before, and we did it just for you. So thank you for the courage. Thank you for keeping on. KBO, as, Ch as Winston Churchill once said, um, keep going. Just keep going, and we will support you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip Dehaney. Thank you for allowing us this insight. Bad people do bad things, and ultimately they have to face themselves. And hopefully Philip's endeavours in the court will bring Alex a little closer to understanding himself and the impact his actions have had not only on himself, but on others. My name's Adrian Allen. Don't forget the likes. Don't forget the subscriptions. But most of all, this evening, Thank you for your indulgence and we'll see you in the next video.